Okay, so this video will be a short discussion of building and loan associations or BNLs. So in the previous video on banking and financial institutions, we've discussed non-stop uh, savings and loan associations. So uh, currently, meron pa mga non-stop savings and loan associations na nag exist here in the Philippines. Uh, but before they existed, na una itong building and loan associations, alright? And then over the years, may mga yun, know, experience sila, tapos uh, may mga changes na naganap. So they morphed or they evolved, they developed into the current savings and loan associations, okay? So from the beginning, uh, ang purpose nitong building and loan associations is, of course, to provide its members with uh, loan. Uh, loan services na pwede nilang magamit for them to build their own houses or to acquire their own homes, okay? So, it's either for acquiring an already built house or to build uh, your dream house, okay? And then, uh, essentially, over the years, it became savings and loan associations. So, savings and loan associations naman, uh, they still include uh, one of the their loan services, you know, for the purpose of building houses, building the homes of, it, the, of the members. So, andun pa rin yung uh, core purpose ng building and loan associations from before. Okay? Uh, but again, uh, just to be clear, itong savings and loan associations, uh, they only cater, not, they do not cater to the whole public. Okay? They have this defined group Tapos yung defined group na yon, meron silang, of course, mga conditions din kung sino lang yung pwedeng sumali dun sa kanilang association. So, it's either a certain profession or certain employees of a certain company or for a certain area, residents of a certain area or a certain subdivision. So, mga ganyan. Okay? So, they only cater to their members, yung pinaprovide nila na loans and other financial services. Uh, for the members only. Okay, and then itong mga members na to, of course, for them to become members, they have to deposit, uh, deposit some money, which will essentially be the operating fund, operate, uh, operating fund of these uh, associations. Okay, so just a short, uh, we'll go over this article from Investopedia about building and loan associations since, you know, uh, part siya ng content ng ating syllabus. So we'll go over uh, just a brief discussion about it. Alright, so for the definition, so building and loan associations were mutually held financial institutions, so they are a non-bank financial institution that greatly increased the accessibility of home loans, so you know, from the uh, name itself, building and loan association. So their main uh, point or main purpose is to provide its members with uh, a financial service or, or financing uh, for their acquisition of homes or building of homes from the 1830s to the 1930s guided by the spirit of mutual self-help so you know mga members they pull their money and then those who would like to borrow money would be uh, provided that service all right and then uh they do earn a certain amount of money from those lending you know they lend their money to their members as well and then uh, those members who were able to avail of the loans would have to pay a certain amount of interest, you know, to the association. And then at the end of, let's say, a certain period of time, normally one year, so if the association is able to report net profit, so the net profit is usually divided or distributed to all the members of the association. So all members are able to, you know, earn or increase their equity in uh, that particular uh, association. Uh, what we currently have, the non-stock savings and loan associations, they are essentially classified as non-stock, non-profit. So their profit are not actually given out in the form of cash, but they are instead uh, added to the equity or to the equity or the capital or the fund. Uh, credited to the individual accounts of the members. Okay, uh, from the mid 1930s onward, BNLs began morphing into the loan uh, savings and loan institutions, uh, which had a charter from the U.S. government, relied on federal deposit insurance. Okay, so 
uh, I think it was after the Great Depression. You know, they were deregulated before the the Great Depression, and then afterwards, uh, you know, essentially there are a lot of these associations that went bankrupt, that were closed down, and their members suffered. Essentially, they suffered the losses because their money are gone. And then uh, it was after that that you know they morphed into the savings and loan associations, and then the insurance commission, you know, the uh, deposit insurance was also created after that. All right. And then understanding a B and L, so also known as thrift. So essentially, they started maybe their concept came out or was copied from you know thrift banks and then it get, gets a start when a pool of individuals agree to pay a membership fee so normally again they have this defined group so let's say if they wanted uh, a certain uh, profession or members of a certain profession to join their association so they would normally have this you know conferences meetings and normally people of these types of groups they do have uh, you know existing uh, network people who are in the same profession or in the same company uh, do know each other so in case they want to start an association it's uh, a little easy to spread the word so just uh, inform someone or inform people and then of course they do have to start as well you know check for the feasibility if there would be many people who would join their cause or their association so they have to check as well okay if we're going to start an association who would be willing how many would be willing to join and how much are they willing to uh, deposit to the association or you know as a starting fund okay uh -huh. so after that after getting how many you know checking at what do you call this assessing the situation checking the market target market uh, they would uh, of course if they officially start the organization of their association then they would uh, ask the members you know to sign up kyc or uh, have this certain form to get their information and of course to get the deposit or the fund okay so um essentially they are the funding or the deposit would uh what do you call this originally it started out as something like shares so one share it would have a certain amount and if you'd like to have a higher uh what do you call this not exactly ownership but you know just a higher share or a higher funding for the association because you know when the profit is distributed after every peer you those who have a higher deposit would also receive a much higher share of uh, the distributed earnings okay so if you want that then you can you know uh give more to the uh, association okay the first pnls were structured as terminating or close-ended plans that expired when all of the loans it made were repaid so at the beginning they are like that okay after uh let's say they do have they pull their money and then they lent out to certain uh borrowers and then after these people have paid back the loan then they would uh be terminated immediately it's as if you know their purpose for is initially forming has already been uh accomplished so they would you know terminate the organization but currently since you know there are more people uh in the case of slas uh, savings and loan associations so they do have more members now and it's kind of you know rotating because there would be new members and then those who are already retiring or would like to withdraw so there are a lot to withdraw so it's uh, as long as they do have members who would like to avail of the services they can go on and continue operating right okay and then history influenced by the british building societies that became prevalent in the uk during the industrial revolution uh, down payments and short repayment periods often five years or less required by depositor banks prove a significant hurdle to middle class home ownership so again um essentially these are the people who are unable to avail the loan services of banks so they turn to other forms of financial institutions to get their funding that they need 
for them to own their own houses. Okay, and so uh, it started out as building and loan association. Okay? So maybe maybe someone saw the need for you know this type of association because there are probably a lot of people who are unable to borrow money from the banks for this purpose. And so they created building and loan associations. Okay, so initially, uh, down payments, short repayment method, uh, periods. Uh, a person who you know is earning, let's say, the minimum wage or a bit higher than the minimum wage, they could not usually provide that the large down payment. Normally, twenty to thirty percent of the uh, value of the house or the loan that would be. Uh, that would be acquired you know the house sorry the property that would be acquired and then the balance would be paid in a uh, short periods of time normally five years i think is the, the, the high the longest okay and in which case that would mean a large amount of you know monthly amortization and for someone who's uh, earning only around uh, minimum wage or a bit higher than that it's still you know it won't be enough uh, to repay that kind of loan and so probably they had this BNLs again and they probably required lesser amount of down payments and then longer period of uh, repayments okay currently uh, nine banks uh, they do what they call this the repayment period is you know you can choose 10 years 15 even 20 okay and then there are some up to 30 years actually pag ibig i think the maximum is 30 years so if you start borrowing from the age of 30 okay you get to retire at the age of 60 so you, you really do have uh 30 years uh, ahead of you to repay the loan okay so in, in that case then you're allowed to uh choose the 30 year amortization period okay and you know the longer the period it means the short or the sorry the lower the amount of money that you have to repay every month all right uh huh okay so the first american bnl started or was formed in philadelphia in 1831 english born factory workers uh the local cooperatives would spring up throughout the northeast and mid atlantic so in a way uh, you know, the concept of having members pull their money, that's the same as with cooperatives, okay? By the 1870s, BNLs had popped up in the majority of states. Uh, growth of BNLs was fueled by the rising income of skilled laborers around this time, okay? So, a lot of people, or, you know, probably back then because of the lack of money or uh, insufficient salaries or earnings that they have monthly. So, they are really unable to... Uh, buy their own houses so most probably they're only renting something like that and still it's somehow a dream for everyone to own their own house okay, to have their own house to call home all right while they typically couldn't afford the hefty down payment needed for a bank loan really at 20 to 30 percent their increased earnings made it possible to buy real estate through this alternate source of funds the use of BNLs reached its apex in 1927 when 12,804 of them were scattered across the country. So there are a lot of BNLs at that time, serving more than 11 million members. So within a decade, however, that influence would be greatly diminished. Okay, so here is a comparison between building and loans associations ever and the savings and loan associations. So in response to the Great Depression and the resulting de deterioration of the BNL balance sheets, you know, because they really suffered during the Great Depression. Uh, and of course, the properties, the mortgages were tied in real estate, you know, houses. Uh, the government began offering charters for a new type of lender, SNLs, SLAs. Uh, while the industry was reluctant to accept federal regulation at first, the benefits eventually became apparent. Okay, so uh, when they were BNLs before, they are they were deregulated. Okay, there is no you know laws, existing guidelines. They are not monitored by a certain uh, government agency, right? But after the Great Depression, and then they introduced the SLAs, 
So there were also regulations that have been introduced and of course because of their experience with the BNLs, people are now reluctant to accept this new type of association, SLAs. But eventually, of course, they see the uh, importance of these financial institutions being regulated and monitored by government agencies. Uh, one example of the benefits that SLAs provided is that they can borrow from uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board established in 1932 if they are you know, cash trapped or having liquidity issues, right? In order to shore up their capital. So for the SLAs from our previous video, uh, we know that they can actually borrow uh, from banks or from, I think, I'm not sure if they can also borrow from the BSP, you know, BSP being the lender of last resort. But uh, from uh, the law that we've read, they can borrow up to 20% of their total interest from banks, okay? They are allowed to do that. Okay. Uh, in addition, uh, there is the insurance corporation aimed to stabilize thrifts by guaranteeing uh, deposits made by its members. Okay, so they are covered by the insurance commission. Okay, uh, the equivalent uh, of today insurance. Uh, the deposits of the members are also covered by the insurance commission. Okay, so essentially, uh, that's it for this one. You know. Uh, that is the end of this article about BNLs and their comparison with uh, SLAs. Okay, so that's it for this video. Thanks and bye.